Hello, it's Jason here with Contrabase Conversations, and we are wrapping up this week of special episodes from my friend and colleague, Trevor Jones, who just launched a new program called the Scholarship Roadmap. And Trevor is chatting with Annie Bossler, who is the co-author of College Prep for Musicians, a comprehensive guide for students, parents, teachers, and counselors. And she does much more, which Trevor will get into in this episode. I actually had Annie's co-author of that book, Don Green, on talking about this for the podcast a couple years ago, and I've had Don Green on in the past as well. So lots of great memories and lots of great content here on this one. I hope you enjoy and definitely check out Trevor's new program at thescholarshiproadmap.com. I am so happy to welcome Dr. Annie Bossler today. She is the co-author of the College Prep for Musicians and the documentary Hollywood Horns of the Golden Years. She also freelances all over LA. She's played with one of my favorite groups, M83, and she uh, teaches at several colleges and is a researcher. So Annie, I wanted to start by asking you uh, just a really general question I think that a lot of students and parents have, and this is why should someone pursue a career in music and how did your training prepare you for everything that you've done in your career up to this point? Wow, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think with with students, in you know, in looking at careers, I the one thing I'm I'm passionate about saying is that you have to be passionate <laughs> about what you want to do. And I think, especially in the world of music, because it's it, you know, it takes a lot of resilience. You get a lot of letters of rejection, um, especially if you decide to go into performance. But I think honestly, any set of music, I, I know any career in in life you'll most likely have some rejection along the way. But I think, you know, I think in terms of careers in music, you've, you've got to be ready to have some resilience. You've got to, you know, be really passionate about what you do because it, it does take, you know, the 10,000 plus hours, uh, you know, to get to get into that world. And so, um, I mean, that would be the one thing I would say to, to parents and, and students is just make sure that if you, if you really want to go into this area that you really feel strongly about it and that you, you know, you have some drive and, and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of myself, when I was in high school, um, just for my own story, my, I, I grew up with, I grew up on a farm in South Carolina. We, we, it's a, a beef cattle farm and we have uh, a bunch of crops. And so, um, we literally have, I think, two stoplights in the entire town. So it's very, very long stretch from where now I live, which is in Los Angeles. And so for me, when I was in high school, I could tell you that I liked three things. I liked math, um, I liked music, and I liked tennis. And so I didn't really have a path or I didn't really have anybody saying to me, you know, here's, you know, here's how to take these interests and to morph it into uh, what to major in in college. And so all I knew was I liked these three things. And so when we were in the fall of my senior year, um, I kept having people say, well, where are you going to go to college? Where are you going to go to college? And I kept saying, I don't know. And so we were in the car um, Thanksgiving of my senior year, driving around to a whole bunch of colleges. Um, we went everywhere from, you know, drove from South Carolina to University of Virginia up to Northwestern. We, um, you know, drove, I think, as far um I went to Pittsburgh to Carnegie Mellon, and then we, you know, did a big loop of back around, came through some schools through Tennessee. I was really looking on the East Coast, and I was very grateful for my parents because we were taking this trip, but we were taking it Thanksgiving of my senior year. So you really can't get much later in the game than we were, um, and very grateful for this trip. We did it on the back of a van, um, and we would go meet some teachers and look at the schools, and and that's really all I knew. So I was going at it with the, the things I liked, and and so I actually entered college um, as a double major or a double in a double degree program, technically a joint degree program, which was math, um, math and music, um, and I also played college tennis. And so um, so I the approach that I took was to follow all the all the passions, um, and and honestly that's led to the current career that I have. But I would you know my recommendation is to hopefully narrow the passion um, as as early as you can, (laughs) and also to um, narrow the schools as early as you can. Definitely, I was doing this way too late in the game, and that's what honestly led to uh, my big passion for for helping students through their, their, uh, helping students navigate this careers in music path. I find also that uh, a beneficial um, bit of self-reflection about your passion, sometimes a student will say, you know, I really love I really love music. And then the follow-up question is, how many hours a week are you dedicated to personal practice? And um, that can also sometimes be an indicator because as we know, if that's not there, things are going to be pretty challenging in the future. 
Yeah, and, and honestly, if I could comment on that is, I I don't think I was ever told like practice as much or don't practice as much. And so I was kind of the person when I got to school that kind of realized, wow, I need to be practicing a lot more. Um, and so in high school, because I had so many interests and so many paths, um, you know, I, I didn't really understand the level of practice, but just so the musicians know there are students out there. So, so for brass and strings and winds and, you know, pianists and singers and percussionists even, there's obviously different amounts of time you can put in physically on the instrument. And I think it's a really important thing to know as a high school student, um, but, you know, strings and pianists are putting a lot more hours than say brass players are because the, just the amount of hours you can actually physically play. Um, and so, I, you know, I, not to say that I would go back in time and say, I wish I'd put in this much time. But when I got to college, I definitely started to up the game a whole lot more because I wasn't putting that much time in, in high school. And because of that, um, you know, it, it took out certain schools, uh, you know, that I could attend as, for college because I wasn't putting in that amount of time. Um, and so I would just say as a high school student, if this is really your passion, um, if someone has not talked to you about the amount of hours it takes to become a or to go into music industry or whatever path you want to take, um, you know, try to try to start to look at that and figure that out because it's something that that a lot of people don't talk about unless you really ask the right questions. Yeah, I so I love that point that you brought up about you know what I did practice in high school. It wasn't five hours a day. I wasn't on the path to go to this school, this top tier school, but I caught fire later, and that. <laughs> That is like a story that I hear from so many people. It's uh, not necessarily you're like a five-year-old prodigy. That's not that. That's not actually how it works. I'd say for the majority of people, and and that's um, and that's okay. I definitely agree. That is okay. So I, I want to follow up then. You know, stick with career paths a little bit. And you know, what are some common misunderstandings that students and parents have about careers that are built on music degrees? The common misunderstanding I, I find with parents and students, I think, are the careers within music. So the we, we touch on this in, in, our, in our book, College Prep for Musicians, but the what I find parents often ask are, you know, can my child make a living? <laughs> That's often, you know, one, one question I get asked a lot. And um, on, on average, I, you know, I teach French horn. That's that's a lot of what my life is about. You know, parents are often like, what, do, what, do, what does my child do with this degree? And so the thing I always say is, is a couple of things. The, the first thing is that you can definitely make a, a living in music, period. Um, you know, it, in, and within music, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different kinds of careers. And my favorite thing to tell students, and, and I talk about this in the book, is you can take the word music, you can make it an adjective, and you can put it in front of almost any career possible. There's music business, music law, music medicine, music industry, music education, music performance, and I could keep going on and on and on. And so I think that's a really important point for parents to understand. Um, it's something that it took my my parents a while to, to kind of wrap their head around, but um, you know, once they did, um, it was, you know, they were, they were really comfortable with me going into this career. And I, I often, you know, I find that students know two things. They know education because they're usually in a band program and an orchestra program, and they know performance because they are currently pursuing a performing instrument, you know? And so they kind of know a little bit about both this, especially if they're taking private lessons. Often their teacher has done some performing in their career, maybe be, you know, performs regularly. Um, and so I find that they know a lot about those two things. I think they know a lot about education and, and performance, but when you get even into those two, those areas, um, even in with education, you can teach privately, you can teach, you know, high school students, you can teach middle school students, you can teach early childhood music education. You know, there's so many paths within just education and then and performing, you know, you've got studio musicians, you've got orchestra tenured musicians, you've got, um, you know, s soloing musicians, you've got touring musicians. I mean, you know, it's, you can go on and on. And then there's genres within that. There's just so many different paths. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to know, and it, at least the way I look at it, and, and I've had many, this is what's interesting. I've had many colleagues of mine criticize me because of the number of French horn majors i put into college every single year. And then like, how are they going to get a job? You know, if you look at the statistics, I think, I don't know how many French horn job openings there are a year, but you, probably less than 40, maybe a year. I'm not sure. I, I don't know that number, but I would say at least in the U.S., there's probably 40 or less um, a year that open up. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the number of graduates compared to the number of jobs, it's not a high, you know, it's not, the entry point is not that high. And so, um, what I always say to people is that 
Um, and I'm talking about tenured track professional jobs, right? Um, and, and so what I always say to parents is the thing I think about for performing degree is it's almost like a kind of a jump start to your career. The way I think about um, the performing degree is it's like a, an entry point into other careers. So I have plenty of colleagues and, and friends that have now gotten their performance degree and are, say, running an orchestra. They're in music administration. Um, Kathy Tizar, the co-author in our book, is a prime example that she did an undergraduate and had a, had a career in violin performance for quite some time, and now she's head of admissions um, at Juilliard. You know, so it's... it's um, there, there's a lot of ways you can get into music. And I, I just think of performing is the way to give you the language to, you know, read music, the language to talk the talk, the language to, you know, understand all the things that a performer would, would need. And then therefore you can go into many different fields within music. And, and, you know, you have ears, if you want to become a music producer, you could talk to the artist. Oh, that's out of tune. That's in tune. That's flat. That's sharp, you know, and some people don't have those skills. It's the same thing as, you know, going into say, you know, a business career, um, and, you know, having that business degree and, and going, you know, and doing other things with that degree. So I think, you know, I think there's a million things you can do with a performing career, but the way I look at performing careers is it's an entry point. It's a, it's a way to give you a language. And I think that that's really important for parents and students to understand. It doesn't mean you have to perform. It doesn't mean you have to do anything within music, but I think it gives you skills, um, that you can carry into any other profession in life. I, I find that sometimes it seems as if people want, well, if I do this, then I'm going to get this. And this degree guarantees this, right? And, you know, it's always like, ab absolutely not. <laughs> and um, if that's what you're seeking, that sort of like, you know, it's a straight line from this to that, this might, this might not be something that is well suited for you. Um, or, you know, the other, the other path is like, let's talk about this in a different way. And sometimes everything that you just said, that's never been introduced to a student or a parent. And that can really kind of be that, that light bulb moment. And, and I would just add one more thought to it is that, um, you know, you were talking earlier about just, you know, what, how, you know, kind of how do you get such a versatile career? And I, I would also recommend to students that, you know, even if they do go into, say, performance or music industry or music composition or conducting or whatever they choose to do, that your whole goal is to make yourself versatile. I think the 21st century musician is versatile. I mean, obviously, like we're, we're looking at each other. You're doing a podcast. You're interested in, you know, helping students through careers in music as well or college prep type stuff. Um, you know, you're you play bass. You know, it's like there's there's a million, you know, there's a million different things that obviously you can do as well. And so I think. I think the the biggest tip I would say to any student going into the to music, especially today, especially now that we've been through COVID or, or in COVID nineteen, whatever you want to call where we are at the moment, but it's um you know um because of even watching this, I mean, so many musicians are currently not working, and I'm watching a lot of musicians do other things with their careers, very creative things, um you know that that are bringing out other sides of of them as a versatile musician. And so I think the 21st century musician has to be very versatile. I think, um, you know, that means websites for yourself. That means, can you code? Can you take your own pictures? Can you, you know, um, can you write, can you write your own bio? You know, there's just so many skill sets I think you need that they don't, that sadly don't always get taught in college. Um, you know, definitely not always brought up in high school. Uh, and so I would say even within college, um, you know, having gone to a school like I did for my undergrad, which is Carnegie Mellon, um, you know, I'm so grateful for that education because I was around amazing coders, like amazing people in computer science. Um, I was around, people that are great writers. I mean, we had to do a lot of writing um, to graduate. We had to, um, we had to take computer classes, you know, which is not always, I think just because of it, it's Carnegie Mellon, you had to take those type of classes. And so, you know, I, you know, I could, I understand certain things about certain computer languages that maybe other musicians don't. And so, you know, just making yourself as versatile as you can, whether it's, you can, you know, my, my husband right now during COVID-19, um, he does a lot of recording. And so he's had to do a lot of you know, union recording work at home. And so he's running Pro Tools. He's having to, um, you know, record and, and send things back and bounce files and 
you know, running logic. And so it's just having that skill set to do these things, I think is really important. So the versatile musician is the other half of what I would say to parents and students is, you know, this passion, the resilience and vers versatility in the field and, um, you know, the and, and just not being scared of the career options would be the, the big points I think I would want to get across to students and parents and teachers for that matter. I, you know, I sometimes think, well, if you would have told me what I'd be doing right now, when I graduated from my master's program, I would have just been like, oh, really? That, I mean, that sounds cool. Also, I didn't think that would be it. And, and it's, it's cool when those changes come up. Like, for instance, you mentioned, you know, using DAWs like Pro Tools and Logic. If you ever have to start using them, like I had a friend the other day, we just walked through how to record something. And now they have that skill. And if someone hits them up for mobile recording in the future, cool, no problem. I just have it. Not being not being afraid to take on new things. Yeah, definitely. That's you know open to the to continuing learning. I think is yeah. really important. cool. So I want to drill down. I really love this part of the book where you had this. Um, it was called a music major application matrix, and I was just hoping that you could explain what that is and then um, what what goes into the matrix. We call it the matrix in the book. It's a you know it's it's kind of the definition of this um, tool is that it's a way for you to, you know, if, if you've got say 40 schools or whatever you're starting with in this big, big list of schools for you to narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down. And then once you get kind of in your top, um, I don't know, your, your last 10 or 15 schools, you use the matrix to kind of help you navigate those last few schools. So, so what it is, um, and I would definitely recommend going to the book to read it because we really spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to make sure that it was understandable to, to, um, to anybody just reading it for the first time. But what it is, is that um, it's a tier system that I use with all my students. And I started this a long time ago. And quite frankly, I didn't understand that college counselors have their own system. And, and let me, I, I should probably pause and, and explain college counselor systems first and then come back to the tier. So, and again, I've never been trained in college counseling systems, like the actual system. So this is my understanding of it. But the college counseling system is that you have safety, reach, and match schools. What it means is that you're when you're applying to schools and for the general population, if they're doing a biology degree or an English degree or math or whatnot, at least from my experience, the students are applying to 10 to 15 schools on average. If, if hopefully, you know, if you can afford those application fees, um, and if not, there's obviously programs where you can use to afford that number. But the average student is um, is applying to that about approximately that many schools for you know for for any of the kind of general degree for music. What I find with students because they're they're having to take auditions and the live auditions and the pre screening. There's a lot of variables that go into it. So you're kind of having to you know take this pre audition audition with the pre screening, and then you're getting in from the pre-screening into the actual audition. And so when you, when it narrows down the whole process, um, my favorite number is seven, seven to 10 maximum uh, number of schools. And that's the number of schools that you're actually showing up and taking the live auditions for. And you have to remember your, um, you know, pre COVID-19 and hopefully post COVID-19 where we're flying to the schools, you're taking a live audition. Um, and that is what, um, you know, the, how the schools determine if you're then accepted. So where the matrix comes into play is that you've now hopefully narrowed your schools down to say 10, 15, maybe 20 schools. And you, you then divide the schools into certain tiers. And so I always need to make this very clear, but when I say a tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four school, it does not mean the quality of education you're going to get. It's based off of the percentage of acceptance rate into the school based on your instrument, based on the number of students that um, apply, based on the number of openings they have every year. So, so let's, um, just a school that I, I know really well um, would say be Colburn because I, I used to work for Colburn. I worked for Colburn for almost 10 years. Um, so Colburn, and, and again, this can change on any, any given year, but let's just pretend. So for French Horn at Colburn, there's six openings. So let's say they have, you know, a hundred students applying for those, those spots, but let's say they only have one opening that year. Right. Um, and so you've got 100 students applying for one spot. You know, the chances of getting it are not very high. And so so what what the tiers are is it's, um, you know, tiers one through four. Basically, it's like zero to two percent 
ex a chance of acceptance into a school puts them into tier one. Okay. Uh, like I think it's two to 5% or something like that is into tier two, five to 10% is into tier three and basically above 10% is tier four. I'll give you another example. A school that I currently teach at is called Cal State Northridge. Um, I just started there. Uh, I'm finishing. I just finished my second year there. And so when I first started, we only had two students at the school. Okay. So my very first year, you know, I haven't been teaching there. I got there two students. They want 12 maximum. Um, my first year we had 17 people audition. So, you know, basically if you could show up and play French horn, I took you. <laughs> um, and so, so you have a hundred percent, most likely acceptance rate is, you know, of getting in at, at that point to Cal state Northridge. Does that make sense? So that would be a tier four school. It, it's great education, a ton of fantastic people have graduated from Cal State Northridge having fantastic programs. But at that time, that was 100% acceptance rate into the French horn department. Again, I'm just talking French horn. I'm just talking that. So that's what the tiers mean. It doesn't mean, you know, the level of education you're going to get. It doesn't mean anything other than pure acceptance rate, probability of acceptance rate, depending on the schools. So if so, once you narrow down these schools to your 10, you know, let's say 10, 15, 20, how many ever you've got left, what you then do is sit down and have a conversation with your private teacher. Um, and you say, okay, on my given day, um, what would be the school level I would get into? So when I was in high school, because we've already discussed, I was not practicing, you know, enough to honestly get into a tier one program. Um, uh, you know, I would have had to have like the most outstanding stellar day of my life and might have had a chance, maybe sliver of a chance to get in. Um, and that most likely meant that everybody else in the entire world going for a tier one, because I just wasn't practicing that much, um, you know, would have gotten in. And that's not to say Carnegie Mellon, where I did my undergrad was not, I, I would say Carnegie Mellon is probably tier two um, in terms of acceptance versus students applying versus whatnot. And they have a different, entirely different set of French horn professors that are there now than when I was there. Um, and so um, I actually think it's, ha it's harder to get into now than when I got into it. But I would just say, you know, so, so that that's Carnegie Mellon is probably tier two. I probably averaged tier three when I was in high school. Does, does this make sense? So, so I, I, I would say I got into a school that was a little higher than my, um, my personal average. So you ask your private teacher, what do you get in on, a, on an average day of your life? Not the best day, not your worst day, but an average day. So I think when I did my audition at Carnegie Mellon, I had a better day. I got into a tier two. I would have averaged tier three. Um, and so that's how the matrix works. So what you do is you take your schools and you go down the list and you say with your teacher, you say, okay, you know, what, what would be the acceptance rate? And if you don't know, you can always ask the teacher at the school kind of what their, um, they might not understand this tier system, but you ask what their acceptance rates are based on the number of students they have. And if they don't know, worst case, you just say, well, how many openings do you have? You know, how many students do you normally have apply and how many students normally get in? And so you can kind of do your own, your own percentages, but then you, you just go down your list and you say, okay, I'm applying to X, Y, and Z school. And that would have, um, you know, that's tier whatever. And then this one is tier whatever. And then what you do is you kind of, you know, take, take my lucky number, which is seven. And you say, okay, you know, I have on this list of say 10 or 15, I've got, you know, one tier four and five tier threes and five tier twos and five tier one. So I've got 16 schools right now on my list. Um, you know, but that's too many. So, you know, if my average day is back to my situation, tier three, let's keep that one tier four, let's bring down my tier ones and bring down my tier twos. And then, and then I can kind of you know, bring that down to hopefully seven schools. And like I said, 10 being the maximum, because you have to remember, you've got to travel to all these schools to take the auditions when it comes to your fall, sem oh, sorry, your spring semester of your senior year. And so um, I hope that makes sense. It's, it's, it's a definitely a complicated kind of thing, but I will say I, I have, I've, I've been teaching, you know, I've been working with high school students now for at least 10 years of getting into, um, college programs. Um, and I've, I've, because of our book, I've started to work with all instruments, uh, but, uh, for French horn and, and actually for all the students I've worked with the tier system, we have a hundred percent track record of getting you into schools, um, because of the, because it, it really does work, um, you know, across the board with, with helping you try to navigate what your average day would be and what schools you can actually get into. And if you use the system also, it will also usually allow you to get some scholarship because even if I am tier three, you need that tier four, you need the other tier threes, um, you know, to get into a school. Um, 
you know, to, to give yourself the opportunity to even get some, some, a good amount of substantial money scholarship wise to, so that you can look at your options financially as well. Um, I'd like to just share one kind of funny story. So when my husband also teaches at a Cal State, he teaches at Cal State Long Beach. And to kind of give you an idea, again, great education, great music school. They're, um, they're known as the Bob Cole Conservatory. Um, and so he started out there again with not a lot of students. And so if you had applied there four or five years ago, it was a tier four school. You would have, you know, he had to accept a lot of students. They had a lot of openings, uh, but now it's turned around. So they're actually, they're actually having, it's a harder school to get into for French horn at least because um, they've done such a great job with the studio that they've now jumped from a tier four to now I would say almost tier high tier one, low, I mean, high tier two, low tier one, because they have not that many openings for the large amount of students that apply. So the percentages of getting in. So it, you know, it just shows you that like, a school just based on, you know, how they recruit and how, um, you know, the, this, the, the, how the students want to come to the school, you know, it just shows that, you know, the schools can change tiers pretty quickly. So you have to really understand what's going on in that school to kind of understand, you know, it's, it's not just to say like, you know, the, the Curtis's and the Juilliard's and the, you know, the, the schools that we think of as, you know, um, the most difficult to get in. It doesn't mean that they also won't drop in tears or come up in tears. It, it just really depends on, like I've seen Colburn have, you know, six out of six openings in the French horn studio since I started teaching there, you know? So it's like, you really have to know kind of what's going on at the school. So I know that's a very long explanation. I hope that makes sense. And, and, and just really want to make sure everybody understands it doesn't mean if you're tier one, you have, you know, it's the best music education or the worst music education. It just means it's just percentages of acceptance. I want to come back to two points that you made during that explanation. And one that I think is so crucial when students are looking at schools is that they contact the school and they try to extract as much information as possible as they can about the school in general, the studio, ask about specific numbers, all of that. The more informed you are in advance, you, you just run into less surprises. And, you know, I think we've all probably been in that situation where we've run into, uh, you know, a student and they're like, well, I didn't know this was going to happen. There was a way to do that, but it actually requires quite a bit of upfront work if you want to generate that full picture of all the schools that you're looking at. But I also think it's also a good indication, for instance, if you're, if you're contact a studio teacher and they're just not responsive at all, well... Now you know that they're not super responsive and that may, that may weigh into how you're going to move forward. But the other point I wanted to drill, drill down on is when you mentioned it's the assessment with the private instructor. What's the criteria that you use to determine their, um, you know, what's going to be the best match for them? Yeah. Um, so to be honest, if I'm doing this with other students, like, like say non French horn players, I usually have a meeting with their private instructor and them. Um, and so uh, if, if it's French horn student, particularly if I've worked with them for quite some time, I obviously will know that, um, you know, just based on, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors, obviously, because I've had, you know, amazing students who honestly just don't perform to the level that they play. And that's why we brought Don Green, the uh, oh, yeah. performance psychologist in our yeah. book, because it's a really big piece that people don't address most in college, much less in high school. And so I find a lot of students, um, you know, and I would, I would actually categorize myself this way as a tennis player. Um, I was, I was a really great practicer. I was a really great, like you watch me play and you'd be like, man, she's good. And then you watch me perform. And it always wasn't to the level that I always could play. And I, and I didn't have a coach until very late in my high school career that taught me to win. And so when I finally, and, and it, you know, it, when I finally got how to win, I went from being literally over 104 in the state of South Carolina to number four within six months. And that's, it just took me to learn how to win. And so I've had some students that I've worked with that, you know, they're, the level they perform at is not the level, I mean, the level they play at is not the level they perform at. And so we have to work on their mental game or we have to work on how they bring it in a performance. And, um, and so, you know, that is a big factor of it. And it, that's not something I can assess in one lesson. You know, I can assess that over a long time of us working together and of me literally showing up and watching them play or me seeing a performance of theirs. Um, and so, um, that that's a big factor in it because, you know, they're performing in their auditions. And so, um, 
so, so that's why if I'm working with somebody that's not a French horn player, I often will have a meeting with their studio teacher, either one-on-one with me and the studio professor or a teacher or one-on-one or, or like a group meeting with the student, myself and the teacher. Um, and so that's a really big piece of it. Um, I find some private teachers don't quite know that answer to how their students perform. They might not all, often see their students perform. So I think it for from a, a private teacher perspective, you've got to ask the students to bring you a, a recording of their performance, a video recording, obviously, of their performance. Um, and, you know, and hopefully several um, of them so you can kind of start to understand that part of it. Um, but at the same time, so just from a technical standpoint and a musical standpoint, um, you know, it's, I try to stay up as much as I can as a teacher. I watch a lot of online material. I watch a lot of master classes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out who's teaching where and that kind of thing so I can stay up on top of that part of it. Um, but assessing the student from a technical and musical standpoint, I mean, having done so much myself just professionally, I can kind of quickly understand where the student is. And knowing a lot of the teachers now, um, uh, when I was working at Colburn, I would facilitate a lot of master classes for the school. And so I got to watch just tons of French horn teachers teach over the years. And so I know their teaching style and I know kind of, I mean, not a hundred percent, but I know a lot of what they're looking for. And so, you know, every teacher's different. Some teachers are super technical. Some pe- some teachers don't want to deal with an arm. I mean, I'm talking very French horn here, but don't want to deal with an ombre changer for your case or, or, you know, a bow hold or something or, sure. you know, hand. And so it's like, some teachers don't want to change those things. And so if I, let's say I get a student late in their high school career, I don't get to teach them from like sixth grade and they have a severe embouchure problem. Um, you know, there are certain teachers that literally will not accept them if, because they don't either A, want to deal with it or B, it's going to take their entire freshman year to change it. And they need them playing principal or, you know, high positions in the orchestra. Um, so, you know, I would say, okay, let's not look at this school. Or let's look at that school. So it's, it's, there's a lot of factors in it. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's just, it's assessing the technique. It's assessing the musicality. It's assessing their, their a performance level under pressure. And those are some things, you know, it usually takes me at least a couple months of working together um, to kind of really get a grip on or a handle on that. But if, if I'm working with a student just straight out the gate who I've never met, I try to get as many, many of those pieces answered as quickly as I can. Um, you know, and then can I kind of assess from there where to, to go. You speak a bit in the book about, um, the concept of tapering. Sure. Yes. So tapering, um, tapering is a word that Don Green uses. Um, it's not, a, so, so having a big sports background myself, my dad played college football, um, and he ran track as well. And then I grew up playing tennis and played tennis through school. Um, you know, it's, it's a word, it's, it's a concept that I understood from a pretty early age, but it's, I never used the word tapering until I met Don. Don uses it a lot with athletes, you know, I mean, he's worked with a lot of Olympic athletes. So he, the word tapering for him um, basically means the rest period, the decrease in practice, the decrease in performance leading up to a competition um, or a audition or a, um, you know, flight to an audition. And so those are, those are things he takes into account. Um, what I've done with students pre-meeting Don was, um, I, I didn't use the word necessarily tapering, but what I would do is I would call it kind of rest and recovery. And so that's kind of how I look at it. So when a student, um, so, so back to this concept of you've got seven schools that you're applying to or 10 schools that you're applying to, you know, within that realm that you're going to show up and take all these live auditions. I haven't met many high school students unless they're major soloists already that are going to do that many competitions in that short amount of time. You basically are are dealing with a three month window, January 15th to March 15th, um, where you're going to perform these seven times or 10 times, depending on how many live auditions you end up having. Um, And you've got to peak at all of them is what the goal is. You know, I mean, you, you most likely won't. So, so step one is accepting that. <laughs> step two is saying, okay, if I could peak, how would I facilitate that? You know, there's just so many variables in all of it. And, you know, if you're flying, you know, climate changes, what that does to your instrument, what that does to your mouth, what that does to your vocal cords, you know, there's so many different factors in this whole process. So the way I look at it is we literally take a calendar and we map it out. We say, okay, here are all your auditions. You also have to take into account you know, the repertoire list for every audition. Some schools will have very specific lists, meaning that 
um, you know, it's like you'll have this, these X, Y, and Z solos, these X, Y, and Z excerpts, these X, Y, and Z etudes. And then some schools are just like play a solo, play an etude. So certain, certain schools have like very specific lists and certain schools have very generic lists. And you can crisscross those um, excerpts and etudes and solos to, to match the different schools. So when you're designing this calendar, where you, where you put down all the auditions you're going to take, you can kind of then say, oh, wow, I'm not quite prepared for this audition because it's very specific. Or, oh, this audition I've already done because I've already done this schools and, and I can crisscross the repertoire into this other schools because it's a very, quote unquote, generic list or generic requirements. And so um, what we try to do is we'll look at where, you know, once you can pinpoint the dates, we put all the dates in the calendar and then we'll say, okay, you know, let, so let's use this day and this day, maybe it's, you know, maybe you have an audition on a Saturday and then you don't have another audition for two weeks. So I'll say, okay, that Sunday, you're going to take off that Monday. You're just going to kind of ease back into the stuff. And then bam, that Tuesday, you're back into the swing of things. So I literally take the calendar and we, we plan it out like a, like I would a sporting competition. You know, I, I used to think back to all the tennis tournaments I'd have to play like weekend after weekend. And you really, you physically can't handle, you know, 10 weeks in a row of back-to-back of -back stuff. I mean, some professionals can, but they've got the tapering or the rest and recovery down really, really well. And so that's what it is. It's, it's, it's knowing on which days you take off. It's knowing, and, and I mean that take off, like actually do not play your instrument. <laughs> and that means even if you're a string player, you're just like, no, no, no I just got to run this. No, you take it off. You mentally practice instead. And, and Don goes through his mental rehearsal in our book as well, but it's like, that's what you, that's what you use instead. Um, and so you physically give your body a rest you physically give yourself some rest, take some naps, sleep plenty. Um, and then you, you taper off. So then when you're, you're fresh and ready for the upcoming auditions, because it is a marathon, it's not a sprint and you've got to, you've got to be able to last that many. I had a student one time do 14. The parent was very adamant, you know, early on in my teaching career, I said, there's too many schools. No, we're doing 14. And I was like, after a certain point, I just have to give up and say, fine, do 14. So about school eight, I thought the student was just literally going to lie on the floor in the lesson and, and just need to sleep the whole time because they, they just physically were so exhausted. And I, and I just said, you know, you need to go back. And I think we ended up cutting a school kind of close to then. I just said, just literally, you know, cancel your flight, cancel the hotels, just don't go. You've, you've done plenty. We know you're into, you know, they'd already heard from a school. We know you're into at least this school. So just cancel them. And they did 14 auditions. And I was like, this is way too many. So they were trying to peak 14 times within three months, you know, so that it, the, the math, it just doesn't work out. They were doing some, there was one week or two weeks where they were doing like two or three auditions, like literally in the same week with days apart. And it's, you're missing too much school. You have too much homework. It's just too much going on. And they also had APs out the wazoo, you know, so it's just like too, too many variables. <laughs> I had a student, you know, she had an audition early in audition season. So like pretty much right after new year's and that audition, you know, it was kind of one of those, Oh, that's how that goes. And, you know, even with uh, mock audition preparation and, and true performance prep, in some ways, if you haven't had uh, an audition like this before, it's tough to know exactly what it's going to be like. So I was curious if you thought there's any benefit to having this type of scheduling where perhaps there's an early audition and then there's a little bit of, say, like recovery time after that to assess that first audition and then use that to inform the next yeah. auditions. No, definitely. I mean, I'll be honest. I find with the pre-screening that it's very, very important. Uh, pre-screening to me, like, so the pre-screening, if you don't know what that term means, it's just all, it's like you have to do a pre-audition audition. We talked about it for just a split second earlier, but it's, um, it's this when, you know, it's this, sometimes it's different repertoire. Sometimes it's the same repertoire that you're going to learn for your live auditions, but it's this, um, you know, these, these recordings you do to send into the school. So I find the pre-screening for all of my students that have ever done pre-screening, I mean, in French horn, it's not required everywhere still. Um, some strings it's required, I think everywhere now or almost everywhere. Um, but for the students that do pre-screening tapes um, or recordings, um, it is light years difference in their playing by, by the time you hit January, they've literally just jumped levels um, for this. And then, and then when you get to the, audition season, I think this is what I would say is always the very first audition is 
you know, is a gamble because it's your very first one. You're nervous. There's a lot riding on it, you know, blah, blah, blah. You get to your fifth one and you're just like, ah, whatever, this is old hat. I mean, maybe you're nervous because it's a specific school or maybe your top choice school, but, um, but you know, it's, you do get comfortable and you get comfortable really quick. After the second one, all my students are usually like, I got this Annie, I'm good. I'll see you in a week, you know, whatever, or I'll call you when it's over. And, um, and so, but the first one is, is, is the one that you know everybody feels nervous about. So if if you have the opportunity, if it's your top choice school, and and you have the option to take it as your first audition or your fourth, I would say move it if you can, because some of the schools will give you multiple dates you can show up. Um, so if you can put it later in your you know your at least your top two or three schools, I would try to put them later or middle of your audition series. Um, but uh, for the top, for the first one, I mean, sometimes you don't, you can't control the gap between your first audition and your next audition. And sometimes you can, I would say if you can control it, then do put space. If you can't control it, then just, you know, be ready to recover and, and get ready for that next audition as quick as you can. And just know that your, your next ones will go, go uh, most likely better than your first one. But I do find a huge jump in the pre-screening. And then obviously if, if you can't control your window after your first one, just do a lot of mock auditions before that first one. And, and, um, I mean, I always like to talk about one of the horn professors in the country who's very well known for winning um, lots of French horn auditions uh, from from the college level, you know, into the professional level. And, you know, he he's kind of well known for having all of his students do 40 mock auditions. And so, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot. I don't recommend any high school student going and doing 40 mock auditions before their college, their first college audition, but do a few, you know, do at least two or three, hopefully more, you know, but, uh, but try to run that list. And even if it's you, I always tell my students, call my voicemail and run it on my voicemail. If you can't get anybody or put your stuffed animals or whatever, your dog in front of you and make them just sit and listen and just, you know, make some, make, just make it a performance and don't let yourself stop. And, um, that I think is the best way to prepare for that first audition more than anything else. Um, but if you can put space, do, and if you can't, don't stress about it, just be more prepared for that first audition. The point that you bring up how much growth can happen once recordings happen. It's, there's nothing, it's, they, they get that, oh my gosh, you go, w welcome to the club. <laughs> every, every time you, you hear that first you know, and a lot of times it's not even a true run through. There are lots of starts and stops and they weren't even aware that there were lots and uh, lots of starts and stops. The whole audition process itself can be such, uh, there can be so much growth that happens during it. I want to finish up with a practical question. Um, just, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if you could look into the future for students mindset with COVID and how they should be thinking about, you know, potential gap years, or I don't want to take a gap year, but I know COVID changes things. So like, what are some things that I should definitely be paying attention to that maybe were not so important before uh, COVID? This is a great question. I've, I, so when COVID hit, um, I mean, at least for LA, when stuff started shutting down, I literally, the very first conversation I had with every student that I taught everyone, whether they were third grade or sixth grade or college or graduate, and I have a couple of adults, we had a, we had a sit down for, you know, hour with every person. And I said, all right, what are your goals? And they're like, what do you mean? What are my goals? And I said, we're going to be here for a bit. And I said, what are your goals? There's one thing that I've learned from multiple professionals, um, and that is, at some point in your life, you have to hibernate and practice. And so I said, you are given this time right now to hibernate and practice. So let's use it, you know? So I think if, you know, if, if you hear hearing this and we're still in COVID-19, my recommendation would be look at yourself and ask yourself, are you hibernating and practicing if you want a career in music, particularly in music performance? Or if you're a composition major, are you composing? If you're an industry major, are you trying to figure out Pro Tools and Logic and all the DAWs and, you know, everything related to all of that, are, you know, are you watching as many tutorials as you can online? You know, so that was what I would say right now during COVID. If, if, we're, if we're still here and you're hearing this, this podcast, what, what else can you be doing? Post COVID, what I would say to all the musicians, you know, look, going forward is like, I was talking about my, my husband, for example, before, um, you know, just, can you record yourself at home? Can you teach online? Um, you know, what, what can make you more versatile, if you can't come in contact with other people, you know, um, get creative about what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, are, do you want to write some, do you, you know, just looking at all the skills that we were talking about in terms of just being more creative as a musician and what, what can you elaborate on or, 
or just have, and I'm not saying like as a backup, I'm saying to just bring forward in your life and say, okay, this is what makes me different. This is what makes me unique. This is what makes my career interesting, you know, and from, from just looking at it, you know, I'm not, I just don't play French horn and I definitely don't consider myself just a French horn player, <laughs> you know? So it's like my life is divided into many pockets. And so, um, but I think that's what makes musicians interesting and unique in, in this world in this day. And so I would say, you know, just try, you know, try to, try to make yourself versatile as you can and just really look forward to trying to, to bring that stuff out in terms of creativity. But if we're still in COVID and you're hearing this, like definitely ask yourself, am I hibernating in a way that will help my career and being creative in a way that will help my career, you know? And so I think those are the things I would say in terms of college. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I would say if you're somebody going into a graduate program, I personally would recommend a gap year, um, I think, uh, because the graduate programs are normally two years, and especially in performance, um, if you're looking at a performance career, I would probably recommend a gap year um, just because, um, you know, it's, it's, you just, you know, if you're going in for a grad program, it's two years long, and let's say the next year or half a year is online, um, do you feel like you could get a lot out of it? Now, if you're, if in on the flip of it, if you're not going to stay at home and hibernate and practice in your graduate degree while COVID, I would say enroll in the program and go, you know, go to school. I think it's more of a question of, I think you have to ask yourself what's going to happen to you in the next year. If you're motivated by online classes and online lessons, um, then I would recommend doing, you know, staying home and not taking a gap here and doing those things. However, if, um, you know, if you're feeling like you really need the ensembles, I also don't think I would recommend enrolling it's just I would still stay home and practice and maybe hook, like find a teacher that you could study with online you know and just pay for that separately and defer a year does, does that make sense um but uh from a undergraduate perspective if I was an entering freshman uh during COVID-19 I probably would still enroll um personally could always look at a gap year um and defer just just to be clear though if you defer just for anybody thinking about deferring on an undergraduate or graduate level you need to call the admissions office and you need to ask the question first of all can i defer how do i defer and what happens to my scholarship and if you defer you know just understand as well that because you're still committed to that school you're just deferring a year you st you are still enrolling in that school the following year so it's not that you can just hop out and go audition at new schools um so so just you know understand from what i gather that is that is the process so so just remember those few things if you're if you're looking at this but i would personally as an undergraduate I mean, I, I'm very bummed for all freshmen because the, the orientation process, I'm sure the schools are getting creative with that, but it's, you know, you're not getting to go and have all the big freshman hangs and freshman class. You know, you're not getting to see all the people in music history, music theory, and, you know, all your freshman year classes in the same way you would um, as a freshman in, in person. So I would, I would just say really use this time as a time to hibernate and practice. So then when you're in school, back in school, you can get back to all the fun things that you, you know, you normally would do. But I, I feel that a lot of schools are handling it pretty well. Um, and, you know, in terms of um, still offering a lot of the same things, I think the, the thing that's most affected are ensembles, obviously. But, you know, use the time to improve your skills. That's a great point. And I, I think there's one more thing that I wanted to add there is if there, the studio teacher that you're hoping to study with, it's a good idea to have an honest conversation about, uh, about online learning with them and see, first of all, I suppose, if they've done any before and if how they feel about it, um, because you certainly want a willing participant on the other side of that, because there, you know, as I think as we know, there are some great benefits to online learning. And so just having a conversation about that to figure out what is this going to look like in an online setting with this instructor who maybe hasn't done this before. Dr. Annie Bossler, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such an informative uh, conversation. And uh, please remember to pick up a copy of College Prep for Musicians. It is a wonderfully written and extremely clear book with tons of actionable advice. For anyone um, that's interested in following College Prep for Musicians, we're on Instagram at College Prep for Musicians. Um, we actually have an online course that's coming out that's by the three authors, Don and Kathy and myself, uh, that will be coming out um, probably within the next like month or two. So probably late or mid to late summer 2020. In addition to that, the book is also available on our website, which is collegeprepformusicians.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah.